Hello, everybody. Um, very happy to be here in Paris, everybody. I'm from Montreal, so I do speak French, except everybody makes fun of my accent here. Accent russe, anglo québécois it's a little difficult, I understand. Um, so um, if you have questions and you want to talk to me and you would like speaking French, I am fully functional in French, they say. <clears throat> so um, we're going to talk about um, from Git tag to DNF update, because uh, um, a lot of kernel developers, actually, who here who has a kernel.org account? Raise your hand. Uh, okay, so good. I thought it would be like two, but it's more like six. All right, that's good. So a lot of people ask me, so how exactly does, does the kernel get released? So when, when, the, when the Linux types in git tag, what happens after that? How does it get from all the way from Linux's laptop all the way to kernel.org, and then there's an announcement there saying that here is the new kernel released. So we're going to go through the entire process. It's called the, just from git tag to DNF update. We won't get into DNF update because this is the same talk I'm giving for LinuxCon next week. So we're going to skip the DNF update. So how does it get from git tag to the front page of kernel.org? And if you want to follow along, it's going to be doing a lot of zooming and, and panning. So if you want to follow along, there's a we are all at the bottom, mricon.com slash git to DNF. And I know this is not going to be popular, but it works better in a WebKit browser. Um, so I'm sorry, Mozilla, but it doesn't work very well. And the reason is because we're doing a lot of panning and zooming uh, on an SVG document. And I don't, know, I don't know how they did it, but it works better in WebKit. <clears throat> so we have a problem to solve. And if you don't know who that is, that would be Linus Torvalds, as explained by the Crown. We need to figure out how to get from Linus Torvalds all the way through the kernel.org infrastructure to this being a kernel developer, a person like you. Nothing says engineering like a propeller head. So, um, and we're going to have a very long journey, and we are going to go through the entire document. And don't worry if you can't read the small text, or we'll do a lot of zooming. So it starts out with Linus doing git tag, right? The command that he runs is git tag dash s. Now let's say this, I was expecting 4.8 to be out last Sunday, but it is not. So this is what he will be doing this coming Sunday. So they're running git tag dash s, uh, v4.8. V4.8 stands for the, that's the name of the sign of the tag. Um, the dash m means the message, and usually it's the same message, so Linux, the exact version. There's I'm hitting the capital S tag, which is the create a sign GPG sign tag, because we're not going to actually be talking about them. So he also also signs GPG signs these tags, but we don't use them in any shape or form at this time. So once he does this, what, what happens next? So nothing actually until he actually pushes those tags. So um, next step is git push origin uh, master dash dash tags. And what exactly does this do? So let's follow um, git is the tool that is used at kernel.org. If you didn't know this, then you've been living under a rock for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, origin is git plus ssh, um, and then there's git master at kernel.org. And uh, of course, this if it is a git plus ssh, then the first thing that needs to happen at this stage is that we need to establish an ssh session going from Linux's laptop to the kernel.org master git server. And so what git does first, then it says ssh git as you will notice it's git at. Um, the names are not exactly the same for DNS, but this makes it more straightforward because it's hard to explain what raw that kernel.org is. So git dash master that kernel.org. And this connects to the git master. And the git master is a server that is located in Portland, Oregon. That's the flag of Portland right there at the very top. And it is maintained by the Linux Foundation. Uh, Kernel.org has been maintaining Linux Foundation for the past um, seven years or so. And Linus is not here, but the same stuff I'm going to talk about applies to Greg as well. He's also maintained by the Linux Foundation. <coughs> so SSH connection is made to sshd at git master at kernel.org. Then we say we only take pub keys, which is we only, this is the only authentication mechanism we allow. And Linus's laptop says, fine, here's my key. And at this point, <clears throat> once the authentication succeeds as a Git user, remember, not as Torvalds user, we pass this connection on to a subsystem called Gitalite. Um, so what is Gitalite? Gitalite is software written by Sitaram Chamarti. He is um, an Indian developer. 
And <clears throat> the reason it's called Git Alight is because he was trying to write a simpler version of Gitorious, I believe. He wanted to have something that has no GUI, he wanted to something command line specific, but worked on the same basis of, of you connect as a certain user, as, as the same user Git, for example, and then it uses the public key information that we use to establish the session to figure out what user you are and then what access do you have to which repositories. So this is exactly the conversation we're having at this point. SSHD says, hello, Git user, um, talk to Gitalite. Gitalite says, okay, uh, what key did they use? And this is the information that SSH passes to Gitalite as part of the uh, environment variables, I believe. So it says, which key did you use? Says, Here's the key that I used. And Gitalite says, ah, so this must be user Torvalds. And says, hello, Mr. Torvalds, where do you want to go today? Um, Torvald says, I'm trying to push to Torvald Linus that Git. And get a light at this point. Um, and every, anytime there is an attempt to a push to a repository, we also invoke a subcommand of get a light. And we call this a. Um, so Torvald wants to push to Torvald Linux to Git from IP address xxxx. And something that we do at kernel.org is we don't allow pushes just because somebody is successfully authenticated, because we are wary of the SSH keys being leaked or stolen, or as we know, it happens, um, just developers do get targeted, that information can get leaked from your backups or any, any place else. So we also require that before a push is accepted, that there is a two-factor authentication mechanism that happens between Linus and our server, and we want to specifically for Linus to say, connecting from this IP address is fine. This is actually me, because this is my device that I can prove it with. And the command that we wrote for this is called 2FA val, two-factor validation. Uh, this is using software that we wrote at Linux Foundation, because there is actually no decent um, open source two-factor authentication mechanism that you can just plug in into SSH, for example, or in many other things. And, yeah? It was it, this. So the question is: Is this new, or is this something that we has been existed for a while? This has existed for at least two years now. It was implemented as part of the. Uh, yes, Greg. Okay. So <laughs> Linus. So Greg pre-authenticated to make this a not. This actually shows you further that once you do this, once you whitelist the IP address and say this IP address is fine for me, this here's proof for it. Uh, then this can, this can happen. I mean, I'm jumping a little ahead, so I'm going to say, so if, there, if the IP address has not been validated, then we say, no, you're not allowed to push because uh, this has not been approved for Torvalds push denied. Uh, we say, then the Git says, remote says, two-factor authentication failed, so I'm not going to be able to push this, at which point Linus gets extremely annoyed and says, uh, not this again, and so he takes out his phone um, if you've ever used a two-factor mechanism with Google or with, with Facebook or any other, they call two-step authentication. This is a Google, Google Authenticator app or any other apps that implement the standard. The standard is called HOTP or OTP, and then there's a time-based mechanism, TOTP, where it takes the timestamps and uses the pre-shared secret to convert a timestamp into a six-digit code. So since we have the same pre-shared secret on our server and on Linus's phone, and we have synchronized time, then we arrive at the same number on his phone and on our system. So then um, <clears throat> to submit this code, Linus SS runs a separate SSH command. So it's SSH git at gitmasterkernel.org, run 2FA val and whatever is the, um, the key, whatever is the digit code displayed, he passes it along. So this then goes back to 2FA val, then we look at, make sure that we generate the same timestamp. The timestamp change every 30 seconds. So once we generate the same timestamp, we know that <clears throat> this IP address is now whitelisted for 24 hours for Linus. Um, he can choose to do it a shorter period of time. He can do it uh, for as long as a month, for example, if he's staying somewhere uh, for, for, from his home, for example. And if, if Linus or Greg are traveling, all they need to do is just to whitelist their IP once. After that, all pushes from the same IP address will succeed. It's, it's been somewhat complicated in some situations because um, sometimes hotels or other companies do weird things with their networking. So your outgoing IP address may change between you know, uses. So we have special cases there 
but really, well, it, it's very rare that needs to happen. So once the IP address is validated, Torvalds then does the same git push. This time we do the same check. We say, okay, so this IP has been whitelisted now. So it goes back to Gitterlight. Gitterlight says, all right, this is allowed to push. Then it, it goes all the way to Git, and Git pretty much takes over um, and writes to the master repositories here at the bottom. So this big blue blob is the master repositories where, where um, Linus is allowed to write. Another process then as runs as a post commit hook uh, and the software that we use for mirroring between the master and the uh, and, the, and the public front ends, which we'll talk in a bit, is called Grok Mirror. And Grok Mirror is called this way because Grok backwards is K-Org, and uh, it's, it's really a mechanism that we had to come up with that will allow us to very quickly mirror uh, changes submitted to um, Git trees to, pr to propagate them all the way out to the front end servers. And the way it works is the Grok Mirror creates a manifest file with all the changes uh, with all the information about the repositories it has and all the information about the refs uh, in these repositories. So if any of the refs changes, a master ref or a new tag is added or a tag is moved or anything else happens, then the, the refs will be changed and they will generate a different fingerprint. We call fingerprint is really a SHA sum of, the, of all the refs returned by git show ref. If git show ref changes, and it does changes be change between any changes to the repository, then we know that this, this repository has changed. And so when we actually mirror, in which case I'll show in a moment, we know that this repository needs to be pulled. So any questions? This is pretty much, so Linus has done git push. We've verified, we've stored it in, in the master repos, and, the, and Linus, the job of Linus has done at this point for, for releasing a git. Any questions about this part? And I will be throwing this around. Amazing, all right, then we'll move on. Yes, really. I will show you later how that the release table is actually updated. Yeah. All right, then let me move on since I only have 40 minutes and I can talk about this for it all day long. Uh, so once we get, so this, the Git master stage is complete. At this point, we need to figure out how to get the information from the Git master to the Git front ends. And we currently have three front ends. There's three flags there. One of them is uh, San Francisco flag, one of them. So it's, uh, there's one server that is in the Bay Area in San Francisco. There is the Portland flag hosted by the Linux Foundation. And then there is a Montreal flag hosted in Montreal. Um, that's the third front end, the most recent one. And the, other, the one of them is hosted by Linux Foundation. Another one is hosted by ISC, known by uh, Internet Systems Consortium. They make the bind name server. And they also have really nice uh, connectivity, really nice peering to all, all of uh, West Coast. And the Montreal hosting is provided by Vexhost, um, their cloud provider, cloud hosting, but for us, they, they let us um, host real hardware. So as I mentioned, Grokmir at this stage, <clears throat> uh, Grokmir just continuously connects to the master and says, have there any been changes to the manifest? Any changes to the manifest? And it happens every 15 seconds. Um, any changes to the manifest? This goes to HTTPD daemon on the master, and um, something I forgot to mention, there's a VPN link between uh, the master and the, uh, and the front ends, and the only connection that's possible to the HTTPD is from, uh, is via that, that VPN link. So then it says, is there, are there any changes to the manifest? And this is actually extremely lightweight operation, because if there have been no changes, we'll just return the code, HTTP code for, uh, document not modified. So this is extremely lightweight. If there have been changes, then we return the entire body of the manifest, which is a JSON file that is gzipped. So yes, here's the latest repository manifest. Uh, there is a new tag for Linus, so there's the, the repository has changed. So at this point, Grokmir looks at the manifest, says, so here's my manifest, here's the manifest I just got. Let's just diff them very quickly and see which repositories have changed. And we don't actually care what exactly changed in terms of what Grokmir cares about. It just says, oh, there is different, this repository is different now. So it passes the control directly to Git, and Git just runs git remote update Torvalds Linux.git uh, dash dash prune, I believe, that's not listed here. Well, 
-hmm. yeah. So the question is, why do we pull instead of pushing? Um, and the, it is a very good question because sometimes the front end can be down. Uh, their connectivity VPN link may be down, something may be wrong, so the system may be rebooting. And I don't want to then have to deal with refetching anything that hasn't happened. Because if the push fails, then how do we tell the system, the, the front end, that something has changed? So the, the pulling is actually easier for us because these systems are remote. Some of them are running across the continent. The connectivity is not the best. So with push mirroring, we found that a lot of times we miss updates because of a there was a minor glitch in the matrix and the, the, the network connection has not succeeded. We could use something like Redis, for example, that um, would be PubSub, which we have actually looked into. But this, for the number of repositories that we have, a pull is a much simpler solution that satisfies what we need to do. That's also correct. It's also correct. We, um, the HTTPD daemon runs in its own SE Linux jail, so it can only read this one document. And we don't have to worry about connecting uh, from the master to random places. It's, uh, it's more important later when we talk about tarballs, but yeah, it's a valid one. So git then says, um, docs to git d on the master. Uh, it's also only available to the mirroring process. It's not publicly available. Uh, the only listening daemon on the git master SSH, as I mentioned. And git d says, here are the latest objects in torvalds.linux.git. It goes back to git d. Git d then goes ahead and just updates the mirror repositories right there. And the other thing that it does, um, the grok mirror then says, I'm going to update the manifest, the local manifests, with the latest one that I got. So next time I run, I'm going to compare, be compare, comparing the, uh, the latest manifest that I have with the latest manifest I got from remote. And it writes out a mirror manifest. So if you're actually using more than one git repo at kernel.org, you can actually use Grok Mirror yourself. It's a, it's a free software. You can set it up and install, and you'll be getting uh, latest pushes as fast as we can provide them to you. And so back to the developer. So now the uh, mirrored manifests are updated. So git clone HTTPS and git clone git colon slash slash would be going to the front end. There is two daemons. There's HTTPD daemon and git d daemon that uh, would allow you to connect and, and fetch the latest objects. And that's pretty much it. Any questions about the front end, the git front end? Yes. No, we don't. Uh, we don't check any history. Um, we have a we have a couple of checks saying, uh, like a mirror, to check if all the repositories on the front ends match the same refs as all the repositories on the master. So there is a Nagios script that runs in every 10, 15 minutes in this way. If there have been problems, for example, if Git D process itself failed. That when it was trying to fetch the latest objects, then we will know that it, it, there's something is wrong because the Nagios will alert saying about it. That said, um, if there were errors returned by the git d, um, then we will not update the manifest. We'll just say something went wrong. Next run, we'll try to fetch the latest objects again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we don't. We pretty much just rely on Git doing its thing. Um, so, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, Is that, that explains it. Yeah, we don't we don't run any specific checks other than what Git itself um, allows us to do. Anything else? All right. So I'm going to move on, and we'll have a, another one. So at this point, step one is complete. Um, Git tag has been submitted. We have propagated all the way, it went all the way to master, we propagated it to the front end, and the developers are happy. So now we need to do step two, and step two is uploading the tarball. Uh, we don't generate this, um, we actually have a fairly interested process here uh, that many people are unaware of. And um, how do we generate the tarball, and how does it get uploaded, how does it get out to everybody's use? So it's a three main commands that Linus has to run. I'm pretty sure it's all scripted for him. So one command is 
Git archive, we'll look into the details for that. Second step is he generates a detached signature, NPG detached signature for this tarball. And the third step is he uses software uh, written at kernel.org that is uh, kup, which is a, a kernel uploader. And uh, I'll explain exactly what it does and why we use it. So the first thing is um, running a git archive command. If you don't know what git archive does, it's basically a wrapper around tar saying, take this object uh, from, from the git repository and generate a tarball that uh, <clears throat> uh, for all the f file objects and everything else that is in the tree corresponding to this tag or this tree-ish object. Uh, so it's git archive dash dash prefix. Prefix says prepend the following string to every file name. This, uh, otherwise you just get tar bombs that expand everything in the same directory where you are. I hate that. Um, dash o use the output name of Linux 4.8 dash tar and then use v 4.8 as the, as the object in the git tree that you should be using for this uh, command for, for, for this generating this tree. Once this completes, and this is a very fast operation, there is a Linux dash 4.8.tar. You'll notice it's not compressed at this stage. And the tarball is, I believe, about 1.5 gigabytes in size, maybe some maybe somewhat larger. And so then Linus goes ahead and runs GPG detach sign, um, ASCII armored for this tarball, and this creates a um, signature, GPG signature for this file, but just the signature itself, it's detached. It, the rest of the tarball is not involved. And uh, so at the end of this, Linus has a Linux-4.8 tar.asc. This means it's a ASCII armored uh, seven bit representation of the signature. So here's where the cup command comes in. And the cup command was written by Peter Anvin. I kind of ended up supporting it. It's written in Perl, which is I would never have picked because I don't really do Perl. Uh, somehow I maintain it now. Um, and cup is the kernel uploader. And the point of this is that we only accept um, tarballs. We only accept things from developers if what they upload match the key that we, the PGP key that we have on file for them. And another neat thing that it does is, as I mentioned, the tarball is 1.2 gigabytes in size. And if you don't know Linus, he likes to go diving. And he likes to go diving in strange places in the world with very bad internet connectivity. And he also likes to do kernel releases while he's out there doing the diving. So he said, I don't want to be pushing 1.2 gigabytes of tarballs. Because previously, before the 2011 events, he could just log into the uh, system and run the command there. Now he says, since I don't have shell access anymore, I really don't want to be sending in megabytes or gigabytes of data over unstable links. So the cup command has a tar option saying, um, everybody see good in it well enough? I guess we'll just have to go with that. Uh, so cup put dash dash tar. So it tells the remote cup instance, uh, we will be generating a tarball. We're not sending any tarballs ourselves. Uh, you will be generating from this repository um, torvald slash Linux that git. You will be using this tag v4.8. You will pass this prefix Linux 4.8 dash 4.8 slash. Um, you will be verifying it with the following signature that it actually comes across with the session. And um, if that verifies, put it into this path. And it's pub Linux kernel v4.8 Linux 4.8 tar gzip. And the tax on the gzip at the end to tell cup that before you put it there, go ahead and compress it. Is that clear? So this goes to the cup server, and the cup server is, uh, runs in a DMZ in, in, in Portland again. And the cup server is um, the only listening daemon, and it is a SSG as well. Um, it only accepts pub keys. So cup then creates an SSH connection to the cup server. It says SSH torvalds at cup.kernel.org. You will notice we don't use Git. Uh, we don't use the same users. We actually use real system users. SSH torvalds at cupkernel.org. So we only take pub keys. Here's the pub key. So SSHD, once the session is established, it says, yep, that's torvalds. Here's the cup. This is now for you. Cup says, okay, so make me a, he talks to Git. So make me a v4.8 tarball from torvalds the next at Git. Um, Git then actually NFS mounts the master repository since it's two VMs that are running side by side on the same hardware. Um, once the repository is generated, once the uh, tarball is generated, the cup passes the control to NewPG. And there's two, three things that come across with this, uh, with this command. So there is a Linux 4.8.tar.asc that came with the cup command. Linus generated it on his laptop. 
there is a Linux dash 4.8.tar that we just generated from the same repository Linux just pushed to. So it should be the same stuff, right? And there is a torvalds.gpg keyring file that only has one key in it, which is Linus's public key. So this is this kept on file. We the only time we update it is with when Linus tells us to update it. It's not automatically refreshed or anything like that. So it, the new pg takes over, runs the verify command. Um, that's the reason we were using tar. Um, it's uh, it, it says does this detach signature match this tarball? If the SHA one, if the SHA two fifty six verifies, then we know that this file is exactly the same as Linus generated on his laptop. So this to point out that the master is really not us. Master is not kernel.org. The master is always Linus's laptop for everything. Um, the, we specifically after the 2011, we do not trust anything that is on, Linux, on the kernel.org uh, servers. We want to only say, we only accept data that is, comes from your trusted laptop, whether that's a um, good idea or not, we'll, we'll not go into this. Um, but at least this way, the onus of proof is not on us, it's on, on Linus. And if Linus says that this tarball must match the signature, and the one we generate also matches the signature, we know that this is a uh, good file and we should accept this. So Cup accepts the tarball, compresses it, we generate two different versions. One is the XZ uh, using LZMA compression, another one is GZIP for uh, legacy reasons. I'd, I'd like to get a way of doing that because they're huge. Um, and we'll put that in temp storage uh, before we go there. Go back. Uh, you'll notice that it's not master, it's just temporary storage. We put it on the DMZ, it's in the temp storage. And at this point, Linus's command succeeds. Linus shuts down his laptop and walks away. Um, as far as he's concerned, his job is done. N not quite true. He also uploads change logs sometimes, and he also uploads a couple other things. But really, the tarball, that's it. Any questions about this process of uploading tarball and cup? You catch it? I hope they mute that when it bumps around because everybody who's listening on the uh, show probably is uh, not happy. Are there any mistakes? Well, I'm pretty sure this is all scripted for Linus. Linus, I'm pretty sure, just runs a file. Greg, you just run a script, right? Yeah, we have the same script. Same script? OK. So there is, when I say he types it in, he doesn't actually. He just says, release v4.8. And it does two, both steps for him in, in line. So uh, I'm pretty sure he doesn't actually sit there and wait for it to complete. Uh, anything else? Can you toss it that way? I see who, who plays baseball. Because it's not really important, because we, we already know that it is signed by his uh, GPG token, um, GPG key. So if the GPG key ver verifies, we don't, ha we don't need any other verification for um, do we accept this or not. right? Because the GPG keys for kernel.org, that's pretty much the, the master authentication mechanism. If we know, when we, when we uh, give out people's um, accounts, we encrypted the key. SSH, we generate the private SSH keys. We, we then encrypt them to the PGP key and send them off to people. So it's really, once the GPG verifies, we don't need any other proof that this is a person that is accepting, uh, so uploading the data. It's really not necessary at that stage. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so therefore the IP address can't really be trusted. Then what's the value? There is a value of this uh, versus, so the storyline is, you know, yeah, um, it, somebody else can then reuse the same IP address. It's probably not it from the same location, so somebody else can forward this. But then we already then restrict the number of possible attackers to a, a very limited number of people versus if we didn't have this, then the attacker could come from anywhere in the world, right? Yeah, but um, it's, it's trivial to get around that particular limitation. So is it really 
Is it trivial? Yes, it is. All you have to do is buy a cup of coffee. Yeah, but then you have to be physically present at that location. Versus if an attacker is somewhere else in the world, they cannot use the same mechanism. Because spoofing IP addresses is not really that straightforwardly easy. You, you, but if you have to be physically present in the same location, then we have made the attacker's job this much more complicated, this much harder. So again, this goes back to trade-offs. The trade-off, this conversation actually happens on, the, on kernel.org users about once every six months. You know, they say, why do we bother with this if, if why, don't we request, why don't we require that this typed in every time somebody connects in? And the trouble is, I would like to have to do this, but people lose their tokens all the time. And then they, they Linus is probably already annoyed, and I'm pretty sure Greg is annoyed at having to pull out his phone and type this in. Uh, if they had to do this every time they interact with, Git that current, with, with the Git master, then I'm pretty sure the, the level of complaints would go dramatically through the roof. So this is kind of a compromise that we came we establish. So yes, it is not perfect. It is better than having nothing at all. It is not, uh, if, there, if you want it to be more secure, we have mechanisms of doing this. We say, for example, all the kernel.org developers, kernel.org admins to SSH in, we have to use uh, uh, physical hard hardware. So the PGP key that's on this doesn't exist anywhere else. We use that to generate SSH uh, public keys. So that, if, if somebody says, this is not good enough for me, they say that we would say, absolutely, if you want to be more secure, please get a uh, PGP-capable um, token like this, PGP card, and then every SSH session will be backed by a hardware token. So it's, it's the real two-factor. That's not a compromise. And if people wanted to do this, if every developer came out and said, I, I, I'd like to do this, we encourage this. We say, absolutely, please, uh, here is the documentation that we wrote. We maintain documentation on how to use YubiKeys, for example, with, uh, with SSH. And we use them every day, all the, all the admins do it. So, but for those who don't want to bother, because it's actually quite difficult to set up your GPG card with SSH and, and make it work reliably every connection. So if they don't want to bother with this, we say, well, so the next best is for us to whitelist your IP address. At least this way, we limit the number of attackers to either the same physical location or the attacker must then go ahead and compromise your router, for example, before they actually allow to push. I'm actually more worried about this than somebody in the same cafe. I'd be worried that somebody um, then says, well, what's the IP address that, Lin that Linus or Greg is coming out from and let me attack that router? and then I can get a IP address on that router. It's much more plausible than somebody shoulder surfing Greg's connection or than buying a cup of coffee in the same uh, place. Okay. You have a good answer though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, it's not just, it's not that they're stolen. Sometimes when you're SSHing into a compromised server, you don't turn off your SSH agent. So then anybody who controls the compromised server can then, as you, as, as user you, can then reconnect to anything using your SSH keys. So you have, you have not, your laptop is safe, your stuff is safe, but you've connected to a compromised server, you didn't turn off SSH agent forwarding, and then the attacker can then reuse that connection, reuse your agent to connect to all the other servers that you have access to. Um, we suspect this is what happened in 2011. I don't know the exact details, but this is the reason we turn off, uh, we advise all the admins to turn off SSH forwarding as default policy and only specifically dash A, capital A, to systems where we need to have that agent. So, uh, but it's also that SSH keys are really easy to leak. Um, they are in your home directory, so a compromised Flash plugin or, or a Java plugin can just... There was an exploit... I'm sorry about that. There was an exploit in... Um, uh, sorry, my Firefox to point you out, but there was an exploit in an Adobe plugin that was used live to, to, to get a whole bunch of home directory things, including SSH keys. Or somebody may be migrating to a different laptop, so they backed up their home directory into a USB key and then just keeps it in their bag unencrypted. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why we want to go at least make this step and saying we'll at least whitelist the IP address. So this makes attackers job difficult. It's not perfect, but it's better than the alternatives.
Like I said, if you want a much better improvement over this, we do have a way to do it. And it just requires more work on your behalf. And you have to remember to take your hardware token with you everywhere. Mm, but then the VPN keys, how do you, how do you secure them? So it's SSH. Well, SSH is also, SSH also requires a private, private and public key, right? So it's also encrypted, the entire session. There's no need for VPN because we already encrypt the session at the SSH session level. Right? Um, not much longer in this because we do have a still whole chunk to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would love to, but they don't listen. Um, yes, if, the, if you wanted to attack a Linux, a Linux uh, kernel, the best way to do this is to attack the Linux developer's laptop. Or you can just show up and threaten them with a piece of pipe. So um, that, yeah, there is, um, the reason I sleep better at night is knowing that if you wanted to attack kernel.org, this has happened, kernel.org has been compromised, and we still live, so the worst that can happen has already happened, and we just move on. Uh, and at, uh, unfortunately, yes, the, we, do, we do have a um, uh, documentation how to secure your laptop. We try to make it popular, uh, and try to say this is, if you want it to secure, to be more secure in your browsing and stuff, please follow in the, the, these instructions that we publish. Uh, unfortunately, this requires changes in the developer's approach. So they have to be careful about how they browse, they, they have to change the way they interact with their system. And unfortunately, that's the most complicated part. It's not technology, it's convincing people that, one, it's important, and two, it, wor it is worth it, which is, uh, unfortunately, uh, Linux developers are very opinionated people, uh, put it mildly. I'm gonna move on. If you have any questions later, you can ask me. Um, so. Um, yes, so previous, we have pushed the tarball, we put it in a temporary storage. So this is, we, we now go to the pub master. And the master is where everything lives. So the master is uh, actually a large NetApp in a high availability configuration. Um, it is not remotely accessible from anywhere, except it lives behind the demarcation, uh, demilitarized zone line, demarcation line. Uh, going the wrong way. The only way to get to that stage is if you have an admin VPN, which is also two-factor backed. So if you have an administrator at, Linux, at kernel.org, which is three people who can access that VPN, including me, um, that's the only way to get there. The stuff inside the, the mother of Perl uh, sort of network location cannot be directly accessed other than from VPN. It only makes connections out, never accepts anything in. So it's kind of like lives behind a black hole. And as far as the rest of the rest of the world is concerned. So how do we get stuff from the temporary storage into the PubMaster? So we start with a, um, another VM. Uh, it's called Marshall. Uh, the Marshall VM is, uh, has a number of processes running, and some of them are quaint. Uh, let's start with the getter. It, um, the getter process then connects via rsync to the cup server. Um, rsync, you will notice, be used quite a bit because this is... Um, the, I call it the blunt force mechanism for synchronizing your data from places. It's not the best, there are other ways of doing it, more, more efficient, but it is um, probably the meanest and leanest one, is rsync. So we connect via rsync to cup server, um, say, fetch me anything that's in the temp storage, say, yes, here you go, here's Linux 4.8.tar, uh, gz, lz, and everything else, alongside with the signature, and then the getter, uh, the Marshall system, NFS mounts the PubMaster um, and puts it into um, the master publication. There is actually used to be time when you could uh, NFS mount kernel.org uh, to get to kernels. We haven't done that in about 15 years now because it's really dumb. But it was probably a good idea at the time, but uh, NFS mounting kernel.org is no longer the case. So people sometimes still ask about it, uh, strangely enough. They also ask for finger. Uh, at kernel.org and why has it been turned off five years ago. So life moves on, things get turned off. So master pub has got everything. Um, 
So now we go into slightly esoteric part of our infrastructure, and it's called a, it's a Raspberry Pi system that is correctly connect, directly connected to the uh, to the Pubmaster, and it's got new PG keys, uh, PGP keys in it. The only reason it exists, there used to be a real a rackable system, but then we needed to use that system elsewhere, and I said, why don't we just put something that one is powered from the USB port on the NetApp and two is connected directly to the NetApp, and we don't really need to worry about it being accessible because it isn't. Um, it's been running untouched for about two years now. Uh, it's surprisingly good at this. Uh, the GPG keys on that don't exist anywhere else. Uh, probably wouldn't do it again if we had to redo it, simply because it's a pain to make any updates to it, because then we have to unplug it physically and plug it into a switch so somebody can log into it. Um, the reason we run this is if you look, if you go to kernel.org slash pop, you will notice that every directory has a file called sha 56 sumsasc And though we use the developer signatures on all the files for real checks, uh, we do have mirrors that are running off of the kernel.org stuff. And if you wanted to quickly verify if the mirror somewhere, a random place in Europe or, or Asia or anywhere is the same it's got the same content as the PubMaster. That's the easiest way to do it is not check every tarball, but just quickly check the SHA-256 SHA sums in each directory to make sure that it matches the key that we use. So this is kind of the mechanism, the mirror, mirror verification mechanism that we use that people can use anywhere, uh, quickly check if the mirror is legit or if they are doing something shady. Um, <clears throat> there is software running in it called DeerSigner. It just basically lists all the directory contents and signs them. Uh, it has some smarts in it to figure out if the directory has changed because it's a, it's a 100 megabit connection. We don't want to uh, run MD5 sums or shout 56 sums on every content if we can avoid this. It's this public free software. If you search Google for Dear Sina, you'll find it. So Dear Sina connects to the NetApp. It says over NFS, it says, hello, any uh, directory contents changed? It said, yes, there is new stuff in Pub Linux kernel 4.x. And then Dear Sina passes to NewPG, says sign, I generated the shot of 56 sums, go ahead and sign them. So, so here's your IC, and then it puts it out there, back to NFS, goes to PubMaster. Any questions about this part? Other than why did we use Raspberry Pi, it just happened to be lying around. Uh, there is no, we don't have any technical reasons why. It's, uh, it was a simple system and it's performed remarkably well. We do, it uses flash, encrypted flash storage, so there is another flash sitting on top of it, so if that one dies, we just replug another one and, and, and start it. And since they're all the same, it's remarkably high availability-ish. Uh, we call it cold spare. So, next is a grok mirror, then uh, we need to get uh, the git repositories as well, live in slash pub, that's why they're called pub SCM. Uh, they used to be all in one tree, they're not quite, but we still store them there. Grok mirror connects directly to the git master to get the data. It's the same exact same process as we do from pub mirrors. Um, manifest first, then if that changes to manifest, we get the latest objects. Um, put it in master pub. You will we'll return to that a lot. So the next step is the question that I've been asked. How then we generate, how do we update the website when we know that there have been changes in new tarball released? And this is done by the builder script. And the builder script, again, runs from cron. And every minute it says, are there new tags in Torvald Linux did git? If there are, yes, yes, there is a v4 and 8 tag. Are there, is there a matching tarball? Because usually what happens is Linux tags things, and then the script then takes about another 10 minutes to generate the um, um, gzipped and, and xz archive. So there is a window of time between the tag is there. But we don't want to generate a new content, new website, because the tarballs are not yet. So then we said, is there a matching tarball? I said, yes, when there is a matching tarball, then what happens is we kick off a Pelican and a build. And Pelican is software, is like um, if you ever used a static site generator, like Jekyll or anything, Pelican, written in France, I believe, is um, a Python script doing the same thing. It then generates static version of the website of kernel.org, uh, renders a static site. Um, it, there is a plugin to Pelican that we wrote. It's also on kernel.org website. Uh, if you go to kit.kernel.org, you'll find the, uh, the website repository. The script that we use to generate the front page is all in there, and all the logic is in there. It's all public. So once the static once the static site is generated, it's also put into PubMaster. And it also the other thing that it does 
Is Pelican, then there's logic there to say if there's a new release that just came out, we are going to generate email notifications. And it goes to uh, vjur.kernel.org. And not, people, not many people know this, but vjur.kernel.org is not actually managed by the kernel.org. It is, uh, it's managed by uh, d uh, volunteers from volunteers and hosted at Red Hat, I believe. Dave Miller is the person who runs this. So um, half of the time, a couple of th emails that I send each week is to bounce the people when they ask for new lists or they say there's a problem, to bounce it to postmaster at vjur.kernel.org. Not to us, because we can't really do anything about this. So um, the final step is the putter. And the putter, once everything is in pub, um, the putter then pretty much runs rsync in a loop. Um, rsync in a loop is a perfectly valid mirroring strategy. Um, everything else is worse, believe me. And it goes to the pub front end. And the pub front end is a, another VM running on the same physical hardware as the Git front end. It's also hosted in those three locations. Uh, one in San Francisco, one in Portland, one in Montreal. And rsync D, it stores and deletes everything else. So this is a very, like I said, Mean and lean, it actually doesn't take that long to rsync. Uh, we probably will redo this and we will investigate again options for um, uh, synchronizing remote directories. There are a number of ways to do it, which is every one of them did not work very well in a very large collections of files. But it's been a good three, four years since we looked, so it's probably better now. So this is how we arrive to a mirrored slash pub. And then the uh, kernel developer who needs to uh, get the tarball, can they go over three different ways? Uh, FTP, stop using FTP, please, it's terrible. You can't use FTP from France, by the way. If you try to go to FTP, call slash slash kernel.org, you will find out that it doesn't work. And the reason is, there is something on the mobile uh, networks, I'm guessing some sort of app that's installed on, in, in France, that every... There is, no, there is a ton. There's, from every, every possible IP from the uh, Orange Telecom and every other places, it connects to FTP kernel.org and then immediately closes the connection. So I'm guessing it's something, it, am I online check or am, do I have the network check? So it then connects to ftp.kernel.org, it spins up via FTP process, but then the connection is immediately closed. So we then immediately tear it down. So this happens, uh, I believe, about 20,000 times per minute or like 50,000 times per minute, something crazy. So we had to turn it off because it was just hammering our systems. So if you are responsible for this, please talk to me because uh, I would like to find out what the heck's going on. We never traced it down to any specific thing, but it is from mobile ranges. So the guess is that it's either set top boxes somewhere or phones or some app somewhere that uses this as a, do I have a network check? So ftp.kernel.org is probably going to go away uh, simply because the entire country has lived without it for the past two years, and it hasn't stopped. They, every now and again, I turn it, turn the firewall off, say, is it okay now? And then it just fills out the, um, our entire process table just rotates every two seconds simply because it just pins up SFBS FTPD and shuts it down again. Um, so we're probably going to turn off FTP uh, kernel.org. There are better ways of using kernel.org than FTP. Please stop using ftp.kernel.org. Um, please use HTTPS, it's secure, and um, we can use caching mechanisms in front of it. You can also use rsync if you wanted to mirror all of kernel.org to your infrastructure, please feel free to do that. You don't have to ask, just go ahead and do it. Um, there's another mechanism, if you ever went to uh, kernel.org, if, you know, if you hover over the links, you will see that they go to cdn.kernel.org, and this is, uh, since People in Asia Pacific and Europe, they complain every now and again that it is too slow accessing servers in North America. Uh, we use a Fastly, which is a, just a caching uh, provider, uh, content provider, to pre-cache things for access from everywhere in the world. So it's really fast for, uh, for you to download our balls. Thank, thank you, Fastly, for this. And Fastly goes over the same HTTPD link. So, and then uh, that's about it. Any questions about this stage? You have to catch. Serve? No, we don't, um, because some people go through mirrors that we don't manage. Some people go through fastly now, which I can sort of look into, uh, see what it is. But I don't really keep track of this information. Simply, few people care. Uh, since it's uh, donated bandwidth for us, we don't have to keep track of this. 
But uh, once, since we started using Fastly, it's a lot less, obviously. And it's not, uh, honestly, not that many people download Linux Tarball. Uh, most people would use uh, their distro to download kernel updates. So I don't think there is that much traffic that is interested in the kernel itself. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. How far does it support process <laughs> Surprisingly, not often. Um, yeah, I. So I went to on a, when four point was released. I was on a vacation in Cuba, and I was did not have any internet there, and um, I was cautious about this because I. It was new, it's a new version. There's a lot of stuff that had to change to support that, but that went off without a hitch. So I was very proud of myself. But we have monitoring in place. So we do monitor, like I said, Git repositories are monitored for any uh, inconsistencies. Um, so if there's something that goes wrong, I'm getting, I get notified uh, very quickly. Um, but despite the number of moving parts, it's worked remarkably well. Um, this was designed, this mechanism was designed after the break-in 2011, uh, designed mostly by Peter Anvin and, and John Hawley. I kind of just tweaked a few things here and there, but this is basically their design. Well, if it's coming up, the hardware is coming up on a five-year limit, end of life, so we're going to redesign some of it. But uh, So the next time I present this, probably going to be somewhat different, but not dramatically, because this has worked surprisingly well. All right, um, any questions about the mother of pearl? All right, any questions about, well, there's the DNF part, but this is for LinuxCon, so I'm not going to mention that. Um, since I'm out of time anyway, if you want to zoom in and pan on your own, like I said, the, um, it is, uh, the URL is mrycon.com slash git to DNF, and you can see the entire process there and follow it. Thank you very much.